Um, so this would be what you obtain if your pie was homogeneous. Let's say it's the snow melt in the springtime, you have a wetting front, the pile is unsaturated all the time, except sometimes close to the surface. And you have a wetting front This is moving more or less uniformly because this is the nature of the, the system. In fact, when you include these compacted layers, which are denser and have different properties that have been measured in the field and in the lab, this is what is happening. And some of you have seen this before. So water tends to move according to these layers that because of a capillary barrier type of effect. And in fact, water is moving deeper and close to the core because of these layers. So it changed quite a bit how you assess the response of a waste rock pile in this case. This work has led to additional um, investigations on ways to improve the construction of piles. And this is an ongoing project. And this was proposed about 10 years ago. It, the, the, the idea is to incline these layers. These compacted layers that will be there anyway should be inclined in a controlled manner so that water would be moving in and following either by runoff or capillary barrier effect that would be moving out so the only wetted area would be close to the boundary of the pile instead of having water very deep inside. If you have non-reactive, non-PAG, for instance, waste rock, you can use it at the external boundary of your pile, so all the water basically would be moving toward this area and not being in contact with the reactive, the PAG material. Uh, the concept has been further investigated in recent years because, again, of this capillary barrier effect. So if you have water infiltrating in your dense layer, it will tend to follow this layer and the interface with the coarser material, the looser material on below. And this will move down until you reach the diversion length. And this is something that is related to the water retention curve of both materials. The diversion length is related more specifically to the water entry value of the coarse material at the base. And the question is, you have a diversion length that is long enough to allow water to be moved out, outward toward the non-reactive material. By the way, we're building a new experimental pile next summer with Rio Tinto on a, on a site to test this on a large scale. And this is what uh, the concept is, is evolving to be with benches uh, and terraces, exposed terraces, to increase the factor of safety and at the same time making sure that water is moving not inside the pile but toward the non-reactive material, which is the case in many situations on mine sites. Okay, moving on to uh, underground backfilling. Um, many underground mi mines now are returning their tailings or sometimes their waste rock underground, and there are many, many advantages in doing that. Uh, and this is an example of paste backfilling. And this is something you see regularly in underground mines in Abitibi, for instance. So the issue, there are many issues in this case, but one of the critical ones is, is the way you uh, fill the stope with your backfill. Because at the base of the stope, you have a barricade, and this needs to be stable. This is a geomechanical or geotechnical issue. And we see here the pouring in a stope, a, a narrow stope, and this is the barricade. And uh, of course, if this barricade fails, it can be a big deal. It can be quite dangerous. So, there is an advantage in sending back, uh, the back the tailings underground because once it has stabilized, it will help the ground conditions around the stopes. But at the same time, you want to be careful that you will not put in too much pressure on your barricade on, and create that type of situation. So we've been working, uh, as I said, on a number of issues. And, and one of the most important ones is the filling rate. And we have, and this will appear in the next issue of the Canadian Geotechnical Journal. If you increase the filling rate, I'm sorry, if you increase the filling rate, the analysis have shown that you increase the total stresses and the accessible water pressure to a point which in many cases will become critical. And there's thus an optimization to be done between the rate of filling the settling and the, uh, the uh, curing of the cement or the binder that you're using and the strength of the barricade. And this is something that is 
being investigated more extensively now to optimize the mixtures on the ground. Other issues that are being looked at include the effect of inclination, where you have stresses that would be different on the hanging wall and foot wall, 3D analysis for galleries when barricades are in galleries, the effect of neighboring stopes that you operate and also exposed faces where you, you excavate the rock and expose the backfill, it needs to be sable. So again, many of these things have been published over the years. Uh, I mentioned that you can return your reactive tailings underground. And of course, uh, you, you may be worried of, of having some oxidation on the ground. So this has been tested. This is, these are tests that were conducted at uh, a mine in Abitsby where you have cemented paste backfill made with reactive tailings. And what we did is we measured, both in the lab and in the field, the oxidation, the depletion of oxygen in these modified oxygen cells. And what this has shown is that, except for the external layer, there is very little oxidation. In fact, the, the backfill remains stable for a very long time, even along exposed faces. So this means that if you have a proper mixture, a proper recipe with the proper binder, you can use your reactive tailings as backfill on the ground. Um, another issue that is of concern in some open pit mines is, is returning some of your waste, either waste rock or tailings, in your op open pit. If you have contaminants, uh, the presence of fractures in your rock mass surrounding the, the, the pit itself will create uh, prefer uh, preferential pathways for water and contaminants to move. And we've made comparison for different situations where we were uh, dealing with a homogeneous rock mass little, uh, with little fractures versus a highly fractured rock mass and compare the situation in both cases. The result really show that it's a case-by-case -case basis, but in some instances, you have to be careful if you want to put back some of your reactive minerals in your pit. So pit backfilling is not always the solution. Uh, sludge. We have done quite a bit of work on sludge. This is when you have reactive mi minerals and you produce acid mine drainage, you have to treat the water. This is a treatment plant. And this is done by liming. Of course, this is a HDS type of application. And this is the impoundment, the pond that received the sludge. And this is what it looks like in the lab when we do column tests. This would be an impoundment to receive the sludge. Um, so we did quite a bit of work on this, uh, and because there was no information on how the sludge behaved, from a, a chemical point of view, it was well understood. From a geotechnical and hydrogeological point of view, nothing was available at the time. And so we did a series of, of tests in the lab, and, and this was presented during the Joe Montreal uh, Hardy address. And I, I will not be uh, spending too much time on this, but again, this has been published. So this is a, a typical setup that allow us to do uh, settlement and uh, consolidation using different means to produce consolidation, including total loading and hydraulic loading. And uh, with this, we were able to uh, do some modeling and numerical analysis. And one of the things that we were able to do is to obtain the complete behavior of the sludge. And this would be the interface during deposition, self-weight consolidation and loading for very large strain using small strain codes, finite element codes. And this, again, has been documented. And at the same time, you obtain the void ratio at different times along the length of the column. An interesting feature of recent work has been uh, what we see on the screen, which we call waste rock inclusions. Code disposition has been used for a long time, where you put, at the same time, tailings and waste rock at the same place, especially for external dikes and dams. In this case, the concept is, is a bit different because we use the waste rock inside the impoundment as inclusions. And we see here in the picture, this is taken from the Osisco site. So these are internal dikes, if you will, and they are made of waste rock that are based on the solid ground at the base. And they, they have a number of functions. Uh, one of them is to increase drainage and dissipate accessible water pressure. So this is a cartoon of what a, a, an impoundment would look like with these um, inclusions. And by the way, this was presented also 
uh, in 2009 at this conference by Mike James, my colleague. So when you're building these inclusions uh, using the waste rock that you already have, and this is an open pit, so there, there, there's plenty of it, uh, you need to worry about or be uh, aware of the properties of the tailings and the waste rock and also what ha is happening at the interface between the two materials, uh, the location and geometry of the inclusions and the effect of these inclusions on the geotechnical behavior of the system, both from uh, a static and, and dynamic point of view. And let me show you a, a few analysis. The first one relates to the fact that these inclusions can be seen as somewhat similar to sand grains, vertical grains, rock grains, or even wick grains. What they do is they allow, they give you a pathway to dissipate the accessible water pressure during filling of your impoundment by moving water sideways and then upward. So you dissipate very quickly your uh, pool water pressure during, again, as I said, the filling of the impoundment. Uh, the, the waste rock at the same time can be kept partially or totally underwater, so it means that if you have reactive minerals in your waste rock, then you can prevent oxidation. And uh, for underground mines, all of your waste rock can go into the impoundment, so you, you can avoid creating a pile in this case. So some of the modeling results, uh, again, this has been published, shows the effect of the distance from the waste rock inclusion. So of course, if you're closer, uh, you dissipate your accessible water pressure. So this is a layered system over 10 years with uh, deposition uh, according to layers and, and you have accessible water pressure generated upon deposition, but this is dissipated. If you don't have inclusions, it takes in this case about 60 days to dissipate your accessible water pressure. It can be much longer if your hydraulic conductivity is lower, for instance. But if you're closer, it takes much less time. So when you're close to the inclusions, you do have a strain gain, you dissipate your accessible water pressure, you have more stability. Another issue that has been uh, addressed is uh, the effect of seismic events. This is the map of uh, the risk, uh, risk map of, of Canada by the the Geological Survey of Canada, and we see here along the St. Lawrence River and the Abitibi region, these are fairly highly prone to uh, seismic events. Uh, and because of that, we, be aware, we need to be aware of the risk of liquefaction and other problems related to these earthquakes. So we conducted a series of tests, uh, direct shear tests, uh, uh, triaxial uh, cyclic tests, and uh, seismic uh, test on a, a shaking table, and again, this has been published, and these results have been used to do some modeling work. And we compare the design of a, an impoundment without inclusion to one with inclusions. And this was part of the work of my colleague, Mike James, and, and various magnitude of earthquakes have been addressed and, and uh, assessed, I should say. And I will show you just one result. Uh, in the case of a magnitude 7 in the eastern part of the country where the rock is hard and close to the surface, uh, a classical impoundment, and this is based on an actual case, uh, an actual, uh, the crest of a dike would be moved during the earthquake by about 3 meters. So this is close to being problematic. If you have these inclusions well placed, you reduce the displacement of the crest to less than 30 centimeters, in fact less than 20 centimeters. So of course you have to design the system accordingly. It has, they have to be placed at the right time, at the right place. Um, covers are another area of research and some of you may be familiar with the work we have done over the years on, on covers and uh, on using low sulfide tailings as cover material. So this is uh, taken from an article that appeared in the CIM magazine again that was sponsored by uh, our industrial partners that use this technology for reclamation of dirt site. So uh, we've been working quite a bit on CCBE. CCBE is, uh, stands for a cover with capillary barrier effect. And this system, this is a layered system, and the core of the system are these three layers where you have a moisture retaining layer at the center. This is a fine grain material, and on both sides you have coarser material and you create a, a, a difference in the hydraulic conditions between these materials so that moisture or water is retained in this layer and it becomes a barrier to oxygen flux. And this is why it works. 
And if it's well designed, you don't lose the water during your year, so it, it has maintained a high degree of saturation above 85%, as we have seen in the field. So it can prevent oxidation of the reactive tailings underneath. Uh, among the things we have done is we have developed both laboratory and, and field tests to measure the diffusion coefficient because the flux of oxygen can be calculated by the, the, the well-known Fick's law and the key parameter here is the effective diffusion coefficient. And we have these devices that allow us to measure the diffusion coefficient of materials for different degrees of saturation. And, and some of you, again, have seen this figure before. But what it shows is that the diffusion coefficient is orders of magnitude when it's dry, larger than when it's wet. And you want to be in this region. You want to be at the low diffusion coefficient. In this case, you can reduce the flux by three, four, even five orders of magnitude and prevent oxidation of your tailings underneath. This has been tested in many ways in column tests, in field experiments. And again, this has been published. The, what I would like to show now is, is a, a model that was developed by one of our PDFs in the past, John Molson, who is now a professor at Laval University, uh, in conjunction with uh, Uli Meyer, at, uh, who used to be at Waterloo, is now at UBC. And this allowed us to predict, and really it, these were predictions because none of the field work was used to make the predictions, to predict the water quality at the base of the cells. So we used only laboratory data to make the predictions based on reactive modeling in the code uh, MIN3P. And uh, this allowed us, for instance, to compare what was happening when you had covers on top, no change in pH, when you, you didn't have the cover and the reduction of pH, increase in sulfate, increase in iron production and so on. And, and using these data, we can make predictions for the long term. Um, this technology has been applied also on a large scale at, at many locations, including this one, the LTA site that belongs to Barrick. This is a three-layered system, and the middle layer here is made of tailings, non-reactive tailings. So it is possible to use tailings because they're still, they have all the uh, properties that are needed to retain the moisture. And this has been monitored since 1996 and analyzed. And this is an example. This is the tailings impoundment with uh, monitoring stations. And this is an example of how the water content in the moisture retention layer evolved over time. And this was the target value that we needed to maintain. This was 85% degree of saturation to make sure that the flux of oxygen was low enough not to produce acid mine drainage. Uh, I, I said that we also developed uh, techniques for measuring oxygen diffusion. This is an example with Anne-Marie Dagenet, who did her PhD a few years back on, on this technique. And using these probes in the field that we insert in the cover, we can measure the flux of oxygen and back calculate the diffusion coefficient and the efficiency of the cover. Uh, again, this has been published. Um, another aspect that was investigated on this site was the effect of a sloping cover. At the time, this was pretty much neglected in the analysis of covers. And what our results show is that if you have a cover on an inclined slope like this one, this would be a, a dike made with reactive tailings. So you, had, uh, you have a, a moisture content that is reduced along the slope, and it can become critical because oxygen even though you, you, you maintain a high degree of saturation at the base, you may have a lower uh, degree of saturation and a, a larger diffusion coefficient so that oxygen can move in. Fortunately for the LTA case, this was not the situation. But in other instances, this is a concern. Uh, by the way, we also published something on ways to prevent this desaturation, again, in the Canadian Geotechnical Journal. The effect of sloping of cover has been investigated and also for SDR type of covers, uh, store, divert, and release type of covers. And uh, this means that you have a cover, and the goal in this case, instead of preventing oxygen ingress, is to preventing water from moving inside the, the waste. In this case, it would be a waste rock pile. And again, we use the capillary barrier effect so that moisture going in will be moving along the slide of the slope inside the cover instead of moving downward, downward. And our analysis, both in the field, in the lab, and by modeling, showed that 
you needed a minimum thickness to be efficient, and the larger the thickness, the more efficient the cover is. But there's a limit to the efficiency you can gain, and of course, there, there are costs involved. So this is a way to optimize the design of your cover. Um, another aspect that we've been working on is a kind of a replacement for water covers. We're not too keen on using water covers in our part of the world, considering the climatic conditions and the challenges in the long term. If you have to maintain dikes, for instance, this is one site in Abitsby where this is an artificial lake and all the tailings are underwater. And, and it's, it can be very efficient in preventing uh, oxidation, but at the same time, it means that you have to deal with the lake for forever. So instead of using uh, submerged tailings, we have been working on the elevated water table concept where the, the water level is, is uh, 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 lowered to a position where all the tailings are maintained saturated by capillary rise, but none of it or very little of it would be on the surface. And on top, the only thing you need is a layer that prevents evaporation, so it needs to be a coarse grain material and at the same time favor infiltration because you want the water moving down. Uh, this has been investigated using column tests, again published, and it is implemented in a few, at a few sites in the province. This is one of them, the Aldermac site. This is what it looked like before. New dikes had to be constructed to raise the water table, uh, and this is what it looked like uh, two years ago. And this is a surface layer. It's about a meter thick. It can be uh, less than that. In this case, it's made of, of sand and gravel. And the dike raised the water table, and now it's been lowered. So all the tailings impoundment was flooded, and now it's being lowered to a position that is maintained, saturated by capillary rise. So as you have seen, and I, I tried to give you an overview of some of the work we have done over the last 12 years. Uh, I repeated that many times over. Uh, most of these results are available in papers and uh, otherwise in thesis. Uh, but there are some challenges that remain, and some will be addressed by the Research Institute on Mines and the Environment. With the funding we obtained, we will increase the size of our team by adding five or seven professors. In fact, most of them are already there. And uh, we'll be conducting a, a number of projects, and I'll mention these very quickly. Uh, prediction of water quality for acid mine drainage and contaminated neutral drainage with metal leaching. Cover design for different types of climatic conditions, including work in the north with uh, the Raglan and Meadowbank mine, for instance. Uh, rheological behavior of densified and paste tailings and pipes and, and on the surface. Pit and underground disposal. Underground disposal is very big within Rhyme because it's a way to deal with tailings in underground mines. Waste rock inclusions in tailings impoundments. We're pursuing field work with the Cisco and other mines. Uh, new ways of dealing with uh, waste rock in new design for waste rock piles. And as I said, there's a, an experimental pile that will build, be built and, and monitored starting next summer. Desulfurization for some applications and passive treatment. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. Um, I would like to thank the sponsors of RHYME that will support our work for the next seven years at least. And I would like to thank you for your kind attention.